So my name is Billy Carando. I am a Java developer advocate with Oracle, and you can find me on Twitter, um, the Bird app, at Billy Carando, where I spend far too much of my time, but please don't tell my boss or any of my coworkers, Nikolai, cover your ears. Uh, important information, um, ask questions though, have a lot to get through, so maybe uh, questions at the end, and if I don't get a chance to answer your questions here, uh, again, reach out to me on Twitter, you can DM me, you can, or you can also send me an email at billy.crandall at oracle as well. Um, and the link to this presentation is at this link, so you can go check it out as well if you want to kind of go back for a reference as well. If you leave with an intense desire to know more, we have a lot of great uh, resources um, that the t our team at the uh, Oracle DevRel, our Java DevRel Oracle, uh, put together. Check out dev.java, inside.java, and our YouTube channel as well. Um, but with that said, let's actually start getting into the presentation. Um, the agenda, we're gonna have about four, five different areas. First, we're going to look at some of the new language features that have been added from JDK 11 and on, um, new um, updates to APIs, new runtime features, deprecation removals, and some other important changes to know about, and then some of the preview and incubator stuff there is also um, have been added. So let's first get into these new language features. And the first one I want to cover is text blocks. These were added in J Java 15. And the JEP for them is 378. So when I say JEP, that refers to JDK Enhancement Proposal. And let me get a new... So yes. Oh, well, unfortunately I don't have internet right now. Uh, I forgot to connect to it. But all the same, if you go to um, openjdk.org, JEPs slash zero, that will give you the full list of all the different JEPs that are um, have been done or uh, proposed to be done. And these are great sources. And then if you were to put in JEPS 378 instead of zero at the end there, that will bring up the JDK enhancement proposal for text blocks, which gives a lot of great information, background, motivation, goals of the new feature that's being done. Um, but yeah, for any sort of some so somewhat substantial change to the JDK, that goes through the JEP process. So for text blocks, well, um, where I find, I find it very beneficial is, well, we've all had kind of to work with code or some sort of formatted language within um, our code as a string. In this example, I'm just printing together a simple JSON message, and we can quickly see how messy it gets, and of course, we're all pretty familiar with this. And, um, you know, while we can probably see where we're, what's kind of going on in here, you know, if we just to be any much more complex, you know, if there's supposed to be some um, nesting, down within the JSON message, it quickly becomes very difficult to maintain. It can be very easy to make a mistake. It can be very easy to forget to add a comma at the end of a line, and you would never really notice it. And then, of course, have to do all the escaping of quotes and then new lines and all that stuff just to actually, you know, properly format it. Of course, we don't necessarily have to do all this stuff for it to be proper JSON, but to be readable, um, if we were to print it out, this is what we would need to do. With text blocks, well, text blocks are simply two-dimensional strings uh, where also a lot of the formatting requirements are reduced. So a text box is denoted by a triple quote, a new line, and then within the enclosing triple quotes, again, much of the formatting is relaxed, so we no longer need to have a you know, new line um, marker. We don't have to escape the double quotes. We don't have to put a bunch of tabs in here if we want to have it tabbed. And the way also then is that the um, enclosing triple quotes also plays a big part in then what white space is ignored. So all the white space to the left of those triple quotes is ignored. Now, this can also be a little bit, um, there's a lot of particularities around how the ignored white space is done. If I was to move the enclosing triple, triple quotes a bit to the right, then the in ignored white space will just be based upon the most left in our most left character. But all the same, usually you just want to keep these triple quotes aligned with wherever um, your um, uh, string is located in closing, uh, or wherever you just want the um, leftmost of that string to be accepted. Um, but all, all the same, this white space here is all ignored, so that way it's that way. So if I was to have this within a method and then maybe refactor the method to where it was 
farther down, um, uh, more tabs over, all of a sudden this string wouldn't suddenly have a bunch of more white space within it. Uh, but fundamentally, text blocks are just normal strings. So if I wanted to do some string formatting here, that would work just like it would with, with any other, you know, a one-dimensional string. Um, if you do want to have a carriage return ignored, on the very last, as a very last character within that line, you would just put a backslash or a backslash. Uh, make sure that it is the very last character, that you don't have any sort of white space or anything after that, in which case that won't be considered. Uh, but then, yeah, it, putting a backspace or backslash at the very end of the line will ignore it. And in this case, um, that um, this uh, text block is printed out as a single line. The next item is the Swift's updates, and these are all added in Java 14, and their JEP is 361. So we're all familiar with the uh, a switch statement with the colon syntax, and one of the major issues of this is it's pretty visually noisy. Um, as we can kind of see here, I had to kind of scroll a little bit to actually be able to properly show this entire switch case. Um, and within this noise does come opportunities for introduction of bugs. Uh, because switch has fall, by, fall through by default, Often what this means in practice is that each of your cases are going to have to have a break statement within them to prevent the fall through. Uh, but it can be very easy to accidentally forget that. Maybe you're doing some testing or maybe you're just doing some refactoring. And so maybe you forget to put a break in one of the cases or comment it out or something like that. And then you push it to production and then all of a sudden you have a bug in production because you hit on case six. But then it also both prints out you know, Friday and then Saturday. Um, so with the updates is we added the new arrow um, operator and with that is if it matches on a case only the code to the right of the error operator is executed there is no fall through so this allows it to be much cleaner in appearance and then also just much more easy to understand okay you're matching on a case you're only executing executing the code to the right of it easier to understand uh, much more compact um, switches can also now be written as an expression. So now when a match is made on a case, then that value is yielded out of the switch. Switch expressions must be exhaustive. So that would often mean having to have a default case included within a switch expression. Um, and then all the um, cases would either have to be the type or uh, uh, a compatible type to what you necessarily set up the expression to be or a throw. Um, you can also, if you wanted to execute a block of code, if just a single line uh, doesn't properly encapsulate what you wanted to do, you can also um, put braces around it and then this will all be executed when writing it as an expression, then you would need to use the reserved word or is it reserve type word of yield. It's not actually a keyword. So if you had yield in other places of your code outside of a switch expression, it would still be valid. You wouldn't get a compiler error for using it. Um, you can also use the curly braces to execute multiple lines of code also within a switch statement using the error operator. So if I wanted to execute multiple lines of code, I could put curly braces around this but in that case, you wouldn't need to have a yield in it because, of course, you're not yielding any sort of value out of it. You can also write a switch expression using the colon syntax. So in which in case, like in this example, you would have it um, each uh, case end with a yield. Uh, as I mentioned, though, switch expressions, they will often need, or they are exhaustive, exhaustive, and so that would often mean needing to include a default case um, but for example, on this with this enum, if I cover all of the different values within the enum within my uh, switch expression, then a default case is no longer needed. If I was to go and add like another value to this enum, if I you know invented a new day, then you would get a compiler error saying that this switch case or switch expression is no longer um, exhaustive. And of course, that also works with the old colon syntax as well. So of course. You know, this isn't forcing everyone to use a new error operator. And we'll actually maybe see a new video coming out uh, to later today with the SIP of Java on some examples of how um, wherein the colon syntax could still be valid or still be um, very useful. 
So pattern matching, for instance, of this is going to be a very important story going forward um, within Java, and this is the first instance of it. If you've uh, heard of Project Amber, um, so Project Amber is actually delivering many of these language fe features I have just been talking about earlier in the presentation. Um, its name actually comes from uh, the a series of books written back in the 80s called The Chronicles of Amber, where the um, a rite of passage within that book is called Walking the Pattern, and pattern matching being an important part of Project Amber. So it's just like really figuring out when I learned about that, it's like, wow, really am working with some very hardcore nerds here at uh, um, part of the Java platform group. But for pattern matching, for instance of, um, instance of isn't the most commonly used of operator or um, keywords within Java. But you know, occasionally we've all had to use it to where we have some sort of variable that's of some type that could just be one of many or just for some reason unknowable as it's coming in. In this example, I have like a number type, um, and I just wanted you know either it's either an integer, long, or a double. And so again, somewhat visually noisy, and also that visual noise and verbosity. Um, does become a bit of an opportunity for adding errors because maybe I didn't set up this casting within it. But yeah, it's just like, even though we know for sure some number type has to be an integer, I still have to cast it to actually set the variable integer i. Um, so pattern matching, what it does is it has a predicate here. In this case, we still have the very familiar uh, of a variable if it's instance of a type. And then if it is, then we have a pattern variable, in this case, integer i. And this i is then flow scoped. And so flow scope is a new concept to Java. And what flow scope is, is that i is in scope wherever the compiler definitely knows it has been set, effectively wherever this predicate is true. So often cases, what this is going to mean is just in the following if block to the code. Um, and we can then see here. For long, um, L will then be in scope for the following if block, and same with D. Um, and this can be very useful because then, uh, here in this example, let's say um, I want to test it for different sizes of the letter um, of the integer. I won't have to kind of think up arbitrary different values or different variable names. I can just continue to use I because for the compiler, each um, I here is in fact a different variable because um, this cannot this cannot be in scope where this is in scope, so it just works together very well to make it very clear. And again, not having to think of like x, y, z for each of these different if statements, just to make sure there's no conflicts. Um, but just a little bit more on flow scoping. So like I said, it's in scope wherever the compiler definitely knows it's true. So it would be in scope within this if block. But outside of the if block, then it would be out of scope. If I just had an evaluation um, block, then it would be, uh, I forgot, I need to update this code example. But if this was following the earlier with the integer i, i would be in scope here, but then it would be out of scope immediately once we leave that evaluation. And it would also be out of scope to the right of an R statement. Um, if you wanted to get weird, not that you should do any of this because this would be very confusing and very bug prone. Um, but if I was to put a not in front of this, um, it would not be in scope within the following if block, but it would be in scope in the else. And then if I was to do a not and then throw an exception, then it would actually be out in scope outside of the if statement um, or the if block. So. Not, I would recommend doing any of this, but this is kind of shows what flow scope um, is involved with. Um, because if, if you did this, this would be very um, error prone because like some other developer or you like two or three months later is gonna kind of look in this code, it's like, what is going on here? So don't, don't do these things, but this is just to demonstrate what um, flow scope actually works like. It's not some sort of arbitrary, oh, it's only in scope following the if statement. It has um, rational logic to it. Next up is sealed classes. Um, these were added in Java 17, and their JEP is 409. Um, and the main benefit I see in sealed classes, I mean, there's benefits beyond this, but is a way to put into code domain concepts within your um, organization. So every organization I've been with, um, there's 
whatever kind of domain business logic concepts. In this example, I have user, where maybe within user, um, there is only you know certain um, number of different kinds of users. There could be transaction types. There could be um, you know shipping types or are so many different types, you know, you're kind of familiar with the domain concepts of your organization. Uh, and there was never really a way to demonstrate this in code or show this in code. But with sealed classes, um, classes can now define who can actually extend them. So in this case, user is saying only guest, customer, and admin can extend them. And within a sealed hierarchy, then um, the uh, implementing classes or the extending classes would then have to declare themselves as sealed, non-sealed, or, um, uh, or final. And in this case, guest is final, customer is non-sealed, and admin is a sealed class, which then allows two different types of admins to extend off of it. So what this looks like in code then is you would use a new keyword sealed, and of course in your class, um, and then there's the optional keyword of permits where you would then define any classes that could extend off of um, the seal class um, user. And then, as I mentioned, um, all of the subclasses would then have to declare themselves as either non-sealed, which is in the case of customer, which effectively makes it a normal class where any sort of class could then extend off a of customer. Next in, we would have, you could also have final, which you know we're all familiar with, and um, you know, in the case of guest, or then you could also have a, a sealed class or a subclass of a sealed class also be sealed itself, as in the cases with admin. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, permits is optional. And so if you wanted to have classes defined outside of the source file of a sealed class, then you would use the permits clause. If you were to define classes within the same source file as a sealed class, then the compiler will automatically assume that these are the only classes that can extend off of it, in which case, actually, if I try to put permits in here, it would actually result in a compiler error. So you can do either permits to re reference external files or external classes, or forego it and then define the classes within the same source file. And the last new language feature um, is records, and these were added in Java 16. Their JEP is 395. Um, the first benefit that you know developers are really noticed with records is reducing our um, boilerplate reduction. Though so, you know, briefly cover your ears for one second there, Nikolai. Uh, but yeah, here it is in this brief ex or this example of you know maybe I'm doing some sort of data transformation and so I have you know a few variables and I would like to put them within this person class now even defining a simple class takes up dozens of lines if I want to you know have a canonical constructor of course defining the the um, fields themselves the equals and so on um, and if I was to try to find this within the body of a method well quickly the um, context of that method is all lost because that just becomes completely dominated by the definition of this class. With records, I get all that I had in that previous example of the person, but I can define that within a single line. Now, I'm sure as Nikolai is steaming up over there, Nikolai is a colleague on, my, on the Java DevRel team, um, you know, records, the point of them is not to reduce boilerplate, but to be able to transparently model data as data. So when we define a record, just within that definition, we already know really all we need to know about that record. We know its name, we know all the different fields within that record, um, and we know this because of there's several constraints within a record. A record superclasses is always going to be record. So you can't extend it, it's abstract, and it's implicitly final. So we're not gonna get any sort of inherited logic or inherited behavior from some sort of superclass. Um, all the fields within record are records are final, but this is only cellularly immutable. So if you were to use like an array or an like array list or something like that, and you decided to change a um, value within that array or array list, then that could still be done, but you just couldn't change the reference that you were using. You can also not declare instance fields. So within the curly braces here, when within the definition of a record, I can of course define other methods and stuff like that, but I couldn't put another instance field within there 
um, because then that will violate the being able to look at the definition of a record to understand what you need to know about it. So with this constraints come benefits. Um, so the compiler will automatically generate the accessors, has code, to string, and equals, all automatically generated. Um, you can also override these default implementations, like you can override hash code or two string or equals to add your own um, definitions. But of course, as you do that, make sure that particularly like hash code and equals that you're still fulfilling the goals of those um, methods. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to run into some serious issues. And it's also why certain things like arrays um, probably should be avoided within records because arrays by default compare by value or compare by reference, not by value. So if you had to have two records um, and they had equivalent values within it, they would not be equal if you were using an array. So definitely consider using lists um, instead of an array if, if you do need that kind of um, um, need. Um, but yeah, here in this example, I'm overriding two string just to something that maybe prints out a little bit prettier than the square bra brackets and then each value. Um, or of course, I could define my own method as well because fundamentally records are just normal classes. Um, so I mentioned how records, they can't be extended, but they can implement interfaces um, so here in this example, in fact, I'm doing like a sealed um, interface. So sealed classes can do, or sealed classes can be both interfaces and classes. Um, and then I have different records, each implementing shape as well within it. So uh, API updates. So first is the enhanced pseudo random number generators. Um, this was done also in JDK 17, it's JEPIS 356. And so before there was four different interfaces, or there still is four different interfaces, and they all had somewhat similar behavior and somewhat similar API, but they weren't exactly the same. Uh, and that just created some frustration if you wanted to move from one splittable type or from one randomable, random type, like splittable, jumpable, leapable, or arbitrarily jumpable, um, to the other, you, it wasn't a simple of changing the import, you would actually have to go through and make several other changes. So now all of these have a uniform API across them or as uniform as is practical because of course there is certain things like arbitrarily jumpable where you would define how much you would jump across that um, random generator. So you know it would have additional API that may not be present in others. Um, but along with this is the underlying um, algorithms have been also updated to be more secure. And generally, it'd be best if you're needing a secure random generation um, just to use the defaults because with every release, these algorithms are also updated. The Internet Address Resolution SPI. Uh, this was at in Java 17, 18, and it's JEPIS 418. And this is part of some of the changes that are coming with things like Loom. Now, this is going to be kind of interesting. This is actually a somewhat larger crowd than I usually present to. But usually it always comes out to, so how many people are familiar with the Java service loader? That, it, it, that's the way it almost always goes. There's always like two or three people, regardless of the room size. You know, if there was a thousand people, it would probably, you know, still only be two or three people. Um, but the way it does work is through the Java service loader. Um, and this can be very useful for testing. So by default, um, we've all had to kind of work where you would need maybe update the host name file on your computer to be like, hey, you know, if it says localhost or if it says this IP address, then to actually reference to this um, um, URL or this other location. Um, now, instead of having to do that, you can actually provide like your own definition to where, and this can be very good for testing support, uh, are also the various frameworks that they can provide their own way of resolving internet addresses. Um, fundamentally, this is mainly done to support Loom, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, because it's going to be changing up how we it uses threads, and that just wouldn't be practical. The default behavior, though, of internet address resolution will still remain the same. It will still use the built-in platform resolver, so it's not a, a default performance or behavior change, but there are very um, there are benefits beyond just being able to support um, Loom. And the code snippets in Java API. Uh, so 
if you were to want to show an example of how to use like a method or an API within your code, um, within Javadoc, you would use the code snippet tag, but that was just all done with using HTML to actually then render the um, code example. And then that also wasn't discoverable by the Java compiler. So there was some sort of, um, of uh, bug within the code, like, you know, just you forgot a semicolon or uh, parentheses or anything like that. Um, that wouldn't be discoverable, and you know it could eventually get out of sync with the actual code. The new snippet tag, this is discoverable by the Java uh, compiler. It's not by default. You would need like a framework or a tool to actually then do that sort of validation. Um, you can also reference external files as well, and these are automatically discoverable um, as long as you set the source path, but most of the time you're gonna be using like a tool like Maven our Gradle, which is automatically setting a source path for you. Um, but this can just be a good way of being able to show more complex examples and um, also having them be able to be validated by the Java compiler to make sure that they are valid examples as well. Simple web server. Um, I'm actually running this presentation on the simple web server, um, whoops, as you can see here. So it's 127, um, 8,000, or the loopback address at 8,000, that is where this is served from. Um, but fundamentally, uh, you know, for doing some simple, um, like when students are learning how to use Java, often a early example is just to serve some files up on a HTTP server. And before, it would have to either go, you know, get like download a separate um, server or, you know, use something like, um, Tomcat just to kind of simulate just a simple web server um, or, or use something else. Now, the point of the JWeb server is just to be as little ceremony as possible, just you know, running from the command line, um, JWeb server to start it up, and like I said, it starts up the loopback address 8000, and it will serve the files from whatever current directory you're in, and the MIME types will be auto configured. So if you have .html, it will be served as text HTML. If you had like .java, then that would just be served as text plain. Um, it is configurable though. If you were to do dash b, you can change the binding address, dash d to change the directory, but you must include the full path, and you can also have a remote directory even, and you can use dash o to change the um, output level for logging. Um, one last thing, um, the Javadoc has been updated to where it will show updates and changes to um, classes, packages, methods, and all that. Um, here, this is for the Java 18 because Java 19, well, it's published under early release, but it's just a bit easier to use this URL. Um, but this is a really good way to see some of the new methods and stuff that have been added to the various classes, particularly something like string has actually seen a lot of updates over recent releases that have actually improved its usability. For example, like removing forward padding or um, padding at the end of a line. Um, there's even things like is blank now um, that's been added to string. Um, so definitely check that out for maybe often used classes or just to see like, hold on, you know, Billy mentioned how there's these new record generators, um, but what was the names of them? This can be actually a really good way of finding that information. Um, let's get into runtime features and improvements. Um, CDS uh, updates. So who here has used class data sharing? Only a few people. So many more people need to use it. So class data sharing is a really nice feature for improving the startup time. Um, what's really particularly interesting was added in JDK 13, which is dynamic CDS archives, where it made it a very simple process for um, creating a dynamic archive or creating a shared archive. So what happens at startup is the Java uh, the JVM loads a bunch of classes from the JDK um, as its core classes to start up. And then this stack goes all the way back in JDK 5. In JDK 9, they added app CDS, which allows that behavior to be extended into the actual application you're starting. Um, and so, of course, every time you're starting this up, this is like the same process, so there's obviously room for improvement. So in JDK 9, this is made easier to where it's only a two-step process now to where if you start your application up one time um, and using the um, JVM arg or JVM flag archive classes and exit, 
the JVM will read all the classes it loads, and then once you exit out or you end the JVM, then it will create this dynamic archive of all the classes that need to be loaded. And then if you start it up again um, with shared archive file, then pointing to that location where you create that archive file, um, it will load from there. You know, it's going to vary a lot depending upon the, pre the application you're doing, what you're doing at startup. You know, if you're part of the startup process is actually, you know, reaching out to connect to and run a database, you know, that's going to affect your startup. But, uh, for example, if I'm just running like a simple Spring Boot application off of my laptop here, it's about a 10% reduction in startup time, um, which is pretty good. And this is also very um, robust to where if... Um, the this shared archive file can't be found, then the JVM will just silently ignore it and then load the classes from the, from the file system instead. So it's not like it can't find it and it'll crash. Um, also, the JVM will only load the classes that it actually needs. Um, and this is helpful is that a lot of times at our organizations or our teams, we use a very similar tech stack across applications. You're probably going to be using Spring Boot across many applications, your Quarkus or, or Micronaut or whatever it might be. Um, and so with that is that the vast majority of the classes that you're actually going to be running in production aren't classes that you wrote yourself, but are from the underlying dependencies. So what this means is really what you can do is for whatever your tech stack, just create one dynamic archive and then just use it for all the other ones because then the JVM will only load the classes that it needs from it. And so that way you won't have to be managing a bunch of different archives, you know, and updating them every time you um, rebuild an application. That's going to really be necessary. But yeah, definitely check out AppCDS. It's, it's not talked about enough. And since things like startup are often talked about as ways for improvement, well, this is a very easy way of doing that. That is also very safe as well. ZDC, uh, Z doesn't stand for anything. It's just the letter they chose for um, this garbage collector. And this was added in JDK 15. It's JEP is 377. Um, the goals of ZDC was low latency. So initially when it was released back in JDK 15, it I always tried to keep it to under a 10 millisecond pause time. Then in JDK 16, they had another update to it, and now it's less than one millisecond. And that doesn't even really describe it because about the max pause times for GDC is about 250 microseconds, and the average pause time is about 25 microseconds. Um, and really importantly, that doesn't matter, just the size of the heap. So and it's scalable from about, I think, 50 megabytes to 16 terabytes. And that pause time should be consistent, whether it's on the very small end or on the very high end. Um, it's currently single generation, uh, but it's planned to become multi-generation soon. Um, but yeah, to get started, check it out. Um, use the JVM R flag, use CDC, um, set your heap space. Heap space is one of the most important areas that will, that will affect the performance of ZDC. You want to make sure it's at least enough for both all the life set of what you're working on and then a bit above that just so the GDC can actually perform garbage collection. Um, the the trade-off for ZDC is it does have somewhat slightly reduced throughput compared to G1. Usually it's about 10% reduction in throughputs. Um, but yeah, uh, if you're going to use CGC, also consider turning on um, garbage collection logging as well, just to see what's going on. And this is a really great presentation by Perlinden. Um, he used to run the ZDC team. Helpful null pointers. I think this is going to be something that makes every Java developer very happy. Um, these were added in JDK 14. But yes, we've all ran into the very frustrating NPE. And the worst NPEs was when they happen on some line to where multiple values on that line could be a possible candidate for being null. And so before, all we would get back is saying like, hey, a null happened on uh, line 14 uh, of your application or of your uh, class. And you'd be like, oh, OK, now I have to you know, do another production build to put some more logging in here to see what was actually null. Um, and then actually then fix it later on with like a subsequent bill. But now it will actually show here that, oh, nope, this, this my record was null on this line. Um, and so that just will make MPEs just a little less frustrating to deal with. ARM Architecture 64 support. 
Um, as of JDK 17, all the major uh, platforms now have ARM Architecture 64 support. Uh, Mac OS was the last with JDK 17, Windows just before with JDK 16, and ARM Architecture 64 support is just going to be an ongoing thing. Um, every release of the JDK does come with farther support um, of it. Uh, one thing I don't I don't want to get into specific numbers just because it's going to vary so much depending upon your application, your hardware, and so many other factors. Um, but definitely one thing to always consider is there's pretty significant performance improvements with every release, um, and they start to build up over time. So certainly if you're still on JDK 8 by moving to JDK 17, you would notice a pretty substantial improvement across every kind of performance category, whether it's startup, throughput, pause times, memory footprint, and kind of any other kind of smaller areas of performance, um, you, would, you should see pretty significant improvements. And even if you're finding it difficult to talk to management or higher levels of your organization as to why it improved, and it's not like if you want to get something outside of just the cool new language features you really want to use, like records, um, performance is definitely a really big one, particularly if you're running on a public cloud. You know, that could be a pretty substantial cost savings. So let's get into some deprecation removal and other changes. And this will also, again, be pretty interesting because usually it's only one or two people regardless of room size. But how many people have used the security manager? Again, yeah, one or two or three, yeah, that's about right. So that's part of the reason why it's getting removed is that despite it being around since the induction of the JDK, um, it's rarely used. And the fundamental reasons, well, there's two major reasons why it's being removed. First, it's somewhat difficult to use. Um, it's just pretty difficult to go through and say for each package, you know, what kind of performance or what kind of privileges you want to have at. And fundamentally, the major reason the security manager was there is for running third-party um, foreign code within your application, well, that's going away because applet API is also being removed. So that was the primary reason it was there is when applets were still very much a thing is that if you had your JVM, you were bringing in this um, external code to suddenly run it, you had no idea whether that code could be trusted or not, or you can be certain about that. So you'd be like, okay, only these packages, only these classes and so on would have these privileges. Um, and this external code, you know, may would have reduced privileges. But that's just not the way we build and run Java applications anymore. Again, Applet API is being um, is deprecated for removal along with Security Manager. Um, so Security Manager also just kind of lost its relevance as well. And there's just a substantial cost to supporting the Security Manager as well. Um, in JDK 18, finalizers were also deprecated for removal um, as well. These are all just deprecated for removal. They haven't been removed yet. You know, it's ongoing. When that's going to happen, it's probably going to be several years. So if you are using the Security Manager, or Applet API, or finalizers, um, move off of them as fast as possible, but it's not going to be, like, removed in JDK 19 or anything like that. Um, things that actually have been removed have been the Nashorn JavaScript engine. Um, it still exists. It's still supported. Um, you can actually go to OpenJDK, the OpenJDK GitHub Nashorn, and it's still there. It, they're still getting some support to it, um, but it's just no longer packaged within the JDK itself. Um, the, CMS, the CMS garbage collector, uh, concurrent mark sweep, it fundamentally was just superseded by the G1 garbage collector, which became the default garbage collector back in JDK 9. So it was removed, um, CMS, in JDK 14. Um, the other important changes to know about is starting in JDK 9 with the introduction of the Java module system, started the... Um, process of more strongly encapsulating JDK internals. And we're seeing a, another big step in that with JDK 17, where um, JDK internals are done by DR, are now strongly encapsulated. So back in JDK 9, illegal access permits um, to make that process of moving from JDK 8 to 9 and above a bit easier was set as a default um, JVM argument, which effectively um, disable the reflection uh, prevention mechanisms within the module system. Um, in JDK 16, illegal access permit was no longer a um, default argument, and now with JDK 17, illegal access permit is a no-op. 
Um, several uh, APIs are still available, like Sun Misc Unsafe and a few others. Um, so that will help ease the process uh, of um, taking in those chains. And um, you can also still do things like ads opens as well to get reflective access into a module if needed. All right, I'm gonna go through this quick because we're running, quickly running out of time. Um, so preview and updater, uh, pattern matching for switch is coming or is gonna be in store preview for Java 19. The big changes were some changes to how null cases are handled. And then also now when pattern matching, um, there's now a win clause that replaces the guard clause using um, ampersands, uh, to the and, and, like an and operator. Record patterns, um, they're in the first preview for Java 19. And so now it can be much easier to extract values out of a pattern. So if here in the example of if an instance is matching on point or object O is a point, I can just directly reference the fields within that record to get the values out of them. Um, the matching is based on the location in the field. So the, um, the variable names, even though I have X and Y for in both cases here, they could be arbitrary names. I could, you know, this could be, be A and B and it would still match on it. It's just gonna be matching on the type and then the location within the record. Virtual threads. Um, Finally, Loom is making it into the main line of the JDK, and virtual threads are now in their first preview for JDK 19. Um, you know, virtual threads or Loom is going to allow for that massive horizontal scalability of Java, and it's going to allow us to have that um, uh, a familiar um, coding, um, imperative coding that we're familiar with, instead of having to use reactive coding. Um, which is a little bit more difficult for most Java developers to kind of work with, um, as well as a little bit more difficult to debug. Um, our one of my colleagues, uh, Jose Palmard, he has two really great videos on that if you go to our YouTube channel on Versal Threads, so definitely check that out um, to get some more depth on it. And then structured concurrency, um, as my colleague Nikolai uh, Parlock suggested, they go together like peanut butter and jelly. Um, so what structured concurrency does is if you want to have a task broken up into parallel behavior, but want to have it be part of like a consistent coding block, um, structured concurrency can enable that, um, that behavior and then also have them to kind of come together into a single result. Also, um, we had our Nikolai covers that in a great um, Inside Java newscast that was released about a month ago now, right? Something about a month ago. Again, you can check out our YouTube channel to kind of get a bit more of a description on that. And the vector API, um, if you're needing to do some math for like image processing or speech processing, something I've never really done too much before, um, the vector API is now in its fourth incubator. And it's going to be continue to be in incubator status until Valhalla is actually going to be um, start seeing um, its inclusion into the main line just because Valhalla, um, the, the changes to the value type system, um, it's going to so fundamentally impact how vector, the vector API works that it's not going to make sense to finalize a vector API until Valhalla itself is also delivered. And I guess I also forgot to include the foreign linker and foreign memory APIs have also been um, updated or moved to preview status in JDK 19. Uh, with that said, um, these are some links, as I mentioned, the um, Oh, the JEPs um, for all of them. Uh, I do have the release notes for 18. Obviously, 19 is not out yet, but once that's released, it would just simply be the same URL, just change it to 19. Um, I mentioned we, I do a sip of Java, a one minute video every Monday. You can kind of see them all here. Also, I know they're, um, one of the biggest concerns is moving beyond uh, Java 8, kind of dealing with the Java module system. Um, this is a really great article from a former uh, Netflix engineer, uh, Carl Masterlon, or I'm not going to mispronounce his last name, but um, he talked about the difficulties um, uh, his team, or at least where he was, was at Netflix, in moving beyond Java 8. Like, it, you know, people were saying, like, oh, it's impossible to move to Java 11. Um, and the big takeaway is really the, the biggest thing is just updating your, your underlying dependencies, really something you kind of want to do anyways for both security and performance reasons. 
Um, and, you know, occasionally it may mean having to make some coding changes to, you know, handle the new API updates to the dependencies, or sometimes you may have to switch out a dependency because it's not supported in JDK uh, or beyond Java 8, which, you know, is something, you, again, you probably wouldn't want to do anyways because it probably means it's starting to get out of date and then it could be running into some potential security issues. Um, with that said, we still have about five minutes for questions, or is it, is it 12 o'clock when the next one starts, or is there? Yeah, five minutes for questions. Okay, yeah, we have yeah. five minutes for questions, so. Yeah. Do, we, uh, do we have uh, three questions in the web app that I encourage you to use it to make questions, and also if you, some of you want. Uh, we yeah, go ahead and ask those questions, and then we can get do to we the have questions. Or now? Here? No. Well, yeah. The first one, uh, what will be the future of Java versioning? Would it stay same with the half of year cadence, or would it be changed anyhow? Uh, to my knowledge, it's still going to maintain that uh, six-month cadence. It seems to have been very successful. Certainly, the Java core team has also um, really liked the six-month cadence, so that should be staying the same. The next one. Should we perhaps expect Java core or similar in the future? Uh, I'm not quite sure <laughs> what, what's being asked by Java Core, or yeah. is that referring to like .NET Core or something like that? I don't, I'm not I don't sure. have any more information. Okay, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, maybe we will find who wrote it later. Yeah. The last one: What will be the future of Java versioning? Oh, again, no. With this yeah. some, okay, two times is something important. Okay. okay. Uh, what is the biggest problem you see in the transition from Java 11 to Java 19? Uh, luckily, the trans like from 8 to 11 um, is a difficult one, just between underlying dependencies and then at least some of the concerns when it comes to the Java module system. But generally, what I've heard, or what we've heard back from industry, that Getting from 8 to 11 is difficult, but getting from 11 beyond is pretty easy. And really, if you're up already on to like 17, getting to 17 to 18, 18 to 19 is actually uh, a pretty easy transition generally. So, Cool. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yep. Mm. Okay. Yeah, uh, so back there. Yep. Can you go to the microphone? Or, well, I will need to walk. <laughs> So probably this uh, question doesn't make a lot of sense, but let's say your library has a sealed class and I want to extend it. Oh, obviously, in the C class, you say permits X, Y, Z, and I'm out, I don't have the access to your source code and your sealed card is in another library, but I still want to do kind of something extended. What would be the good practice here? Well, for like a sealed class, you said? Yeah, exactly. C class. Yeah. So you said C class user permits, I don't know, yeah, employee, person, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. And now in my code, I don't have access. I, I just Your code is in some other library. Obviously, I don't have access to the source code. I can't change it. So I still want to use it somehow. I want to extend it in a sense. So do how can I make this happen? How does, is, does it... So, yeah. so you're saying you want, so there's like a sealed hierarchy, mm -hmm. and there's like some class that you then want to extend from it that it doesn't. Have, well, part of that is to prevent that from happening. Okay. You know, like a like a framework or a library maintainer would be like, no, I don't want to allow any other class that's using this library to extend it because then that could violate some of the behavior of the class. Now you can. Potentially, depending upon those subclasses, how they're defined, like if they're non-sealed classes, you could extend off of them. But, you know, part of the point, point of a sealed hierarchy is to prevent people from arbitrarily extending classes. All right, fair okay. enough. I mean, mm -hmm. sooner or later, it's going to be stuck over the question. Somebody's asking, and going to ask this, but yeah. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cheers. Okay, any, any other? more questions? Okay. Well, if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to come up or, like, you know, grab me in the hallway. Or, of course, also you can um, reach out to me via Twitter or email. So, anyways, thanks for uh, coming. <laughs>